But what I wanted to talk about today was cervical deformity and its implication on spinal balance. Dr. Jens Chapman did a wonderful job with cervical thoracic spine. A lot of what he said um, will tie into this, and in the true form of SSF, we'll go next to each other to tie in a lot of our, our understanding of spinal deformity. In the interest of time, I'm going to go really fast. So I have a 68-year-old who has difficulty with horizontal gaze, severe neck pain, late afternoon back pain. She says, I'm fine in the morning, late in the afternoon, I can't stand, I can't walk. She has no arm pain. Um, she has left shoulder pain, and she quit smoking seven months ago. And she is osteopenic. She claims she has good bone quality because she's from good stock, but she is, she is osteopenic on, on Dexter's scan. So these are her films. So one of the first, you know, one of the things that I enjoy about SSF is I come here and one of the, some of the best surgeons in the whole world including Dr. Chapman, they never show their amazing look at me um, talks and look at how great I do. They show their wound dehiscence, complications, and it's very humbling for me. And I said, wow, these are the giants in the field. They're open disclosure. So I'm revising myself and saying, here are some of the things that I missed. She had sitting cervical x-rays and she had standing scoliosis films. Anybody see a difference in her cervical alignment from Right, this was mistake number one. Looking at this and not realizing that I had a huge problem, fixed versus flexible deformity. Go ahead, I know you I want to talk. I want to say one thing. Say. This is so near and dear to my heart. I want all of us to participate in the study. This patient has a dentitia, no flipping teeth. Yes. This is a risk progenitor of primary order. I appeal to Thank all you. of us to identify a dentitia <laughs> as a negative prognostic factor. Right. <laughs> there's, there's some uh, comments that everybody wants to say about She has good bone stock, Dr. Chapman, whether you like it or not. <laughs> so I looked at this and I said, things that go through my mind, things that you should have in your mind. Scoliosis, uh, you know, cervical SVA, cer uh, you know, cervical chin brow ang vertebral angle. T1 inclination, Dr. Chapman mentioned that extensively. And we also talk about the cervical thoracic pelvic angle. That's how your neck is balanced on your body. You got to think about it. Bone quality, spine flexibility, and I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. But look at her cervical MRI. Other than one level that moderately maybe stenotic, it looked fine. But this is how she, I looked at her cervical x-ray sitting, and I looked at her scoliosis, both on different servers, I didn't connect the dots. I didn't think I had a problem. I always said, we're gonna do a cervical deformity surgery, and here we go. So what are the questions about cervical deformity and its implication to, to uh, sagittal alignment, spine alignment? Are there fully established cervical deformity classifications and treatment options? You bet they are. Are there defined indications for surgery to correct cervical malalignment? Yes. Are there set standards to address the amount of correction needed? These are all evolving techniques, and what is the impact of regional cervical sagittal alignment on outcomes? It's very impressive. So I'm just challenging you. I'm, I'm giving you gestalt. I'm not measuring any angles for you. I just challenge you all. This was circa eight years ago. Angles, measurements, important. I expect everybody here to have a fundamental uh, work and knowledge of measuring these angles and to say, well, one of these look weird. I'm going to look it up right now. So what's the cervical spine? It's responsible for your head over your body, level, horizontal gaze, center of mass is one centimeter above and anterior to the external uh, auricular canal and also overlying the occipital, um, the occiput. So any change in that center of mass causes cantilever adjustments. And you have to look at it from a biomechanical stability point, saying that we have a one anterior column with vertebral bodies and disc and two posterior columns with articulating facets. So this all contributes to load sharing. This is all fundamentals that everybody in this room knows. It's a fundamental higher resident fellows course. 36% of your anterior columns um, there is the load that it carries, but 64% in the posterior columns. That's flipped compared to the uh, thoracolumbar columns. So why the lordotic cervical spine? 
it's compensating for your thoracic kyphosis, and it's, which is needed for you know, expansion of your lung volumes, i.e. the thoracic kyphosis, and it increases with age. Dr. Chapman just mentioned that. Any deviation from the flexible lordosis to a stiff cervical kyphosis inc increases pain. Example, and also disability, and what I call the Lego uh, going up erector set up the spine. Here's a look at a 67-year-old gentleman, came to another surgeon, lumbar degenerative disease, vacuum disc, et cetera, stenosis, had the surgery by him, did well until he crashed into my ER. Five years later, extreme weakness, multiple thoracic stenosis, so we did a nice surgery. Now look, at, look from the left of the column to the right of the column. Look at the stiff cervical spine inability to compensate lordosis. So if you look at the column, he had a great extension of his fusion, decompression, stabilization, his uh, sagittal alignment, parameters, perfectly done. Then I went up a few levels because he, guess what? He had a PJK, he had a talk by Dr. Sansor about that. Now we're in the cervical spine, we're in C2 because he came back again um, at the cervical thoracic junction um, uh, deficient. So I could say, well, we had a perfect alignment the first time, but he had a failure to compensate rigid cervical spine and inability to compensate for what we did thoracically. So what the neck, you know, the neck affects the back, the back affects the neck if there's very poor flexibility. So. Some of the things about cervical deformity is how prevalent it is. You know, cervical deformity is highly prevalent in adults with thoracolumbar deformity. Uh, there's, a pre uh, there's a prevalence of cervical kyphosis and uh, poor uh, sagittal malalignment in about, you know, 31 to 50 uh, to 53 percent of people who have cervical who have thoracolumbar deformities. So, how does this affect cervical deformity? Right. So, if you fuse somebody. Post-operative in cervical kyphosis, you increase the deformity, you, in, you decrease the HRQOLs if you follow them long enough. If you only have somebody who's a six month, best six months, they're not gonna see this. You need to know how to measure uh, patients with standing, right, that had sitting cervical films. You have to be standing. There are three types you could do from a Cobb to Jackson lines to Harrison segmental lines and the Harrison lines, the tangential lines are the most accurate. We, you know, global Cobb alignment, you can always get that uh, easily. Not all the segments contribute equally to lordosis, right? So C12, significantly important, which translates to if somebody, then you do a C12 fusion on a patient. If they have issues with a stiff cervical spine, they could lose a lot of the alignment. And this could lead to lots of disability, including breathing, swallowing, myelopathy, radiculopathy on the subaxial spine, and other regional differences. So there is a repercussion for that, and it could be from this, uh, uh, d this picture that I picked from a journal cover is, Regional differences affect global spinal alignment. It's all about compensation. It's all about the cone of economy. And the impact of cervical deformity is really high. You can see that you know, patients who have significant cervical deformity um, have the same mental stress and also the same anguish as um, you, somebody who has significant health issues from poor vision to emphysema. And this is significant to recognize, but how do we know what we're, we're facing, right? You need to know what the impact of standing regional cervical sagittal alignment on the outcomes to pursue cervical fusion. You need to know these outcomes to recognize that patients who have a distortion of that alignment, it carries significant health effects. This could be done iatrogenically, or this could be as a compensatory mechanism for something that was done in other parts of the spine. You have to know um, other parts and other, uh, uh, other measurements that we use to evaluate deformity, which is correlating to poor HRQLs, which is the translation. And this translation matters. It's equivalent to 
fully erect standing, you're 12 pounds, up to if you lose your cervical uh, uh, thoracic uh, pelvic angle, your neck is so far out. In Pittsburgh, I call it, these are coming in with a cobra neck. They're fusing a the kyphotic deformity. That is how they are able to compensate. It's like carrying a 42 pound weight. These people do not do well standing upright for a long time. There's another subset moving higher up with the loss of the center of gravity of the head over the uh, uh, chest, which are people who have serious uh, chin brow verte verte uh, vertebra angle um, uh, dissociation, difficulty with carrying the uh, um, head about and maintaining a horizontal gaze. And these are mostly with rigid deformities that require you to think about it osteotomies, mostly from the posterior region. And the last thing is something that's really new, and this is really in the cervical thoracic junction, which affects cervical um, lordosis. And Dr. Chapman mentioned it, the, uh, the T1 uh, slope or inclination angle. If you have a small T1, you need a small cervical lordosis to maintain physiologic neck tilting. It's all about your balance and cone of economy, right? So there are many papers out there that you should be familiar. And this is the use of a T1 sagittal angle in predicting the overall sagittal balance of the spine. Um, can measurements on the cervical, uh, on cervical radiograph predict concurrent thoracic lumbar deformity and provide a threshold of acquiring full length spine? Those are very crucial papers that were cited twice in, in the lecture series of, of, of uh, this uh, meeting. So things that I want to sum up and conclude, I thought we were running out of time, is the value of a T1 uh, slope minus the cervical lordosis has been reported in numerous studies in the literature. However, you want to get a degree of about 17 difference. This is your cervical PI minus LL difference to say anytime you cross over 20 uh, degrees, you have to appreciate that this patient will have poor HRQLs and poor ability to balance. For example, these are three pictures of patients that are right on the borderline, T1 uh, slope minus their cervical lordosis. But you have to look at it as it's not just one measurement all the time. Look at who's balanced, look at who's extending energy. The first patient on the uh, left also has a horrible cervical thoracic pelvic inclination. Even though the T1 uh, slope minus uh, uh, cervical lordosis is 17 degrees, they are not exactly balanced because they have other modalities that are of concern. So looking at just one modality doesn't do it. Multiple modalities versus a patient who has no cervical on the far, uh, or should I say the right, has mostly no cervical lordosis whatsoever, but they seem to be more balanced. Um, because they have a small um, cervical lordosis matching a small T1 slope. So you have to look at this in the distal as you take these measurements. It's not just one that mat matters, and that's part of cervical deformity um, assessment, um, et cetera. So things that we're doing now is what are the minimal, maximal surgeries for certain types of curves that matter in terms of correction deformity? There's significant things to note about that because of the complications associated with uh, cervical deformity uh, uh, treatment. Anterior loan versus posterior loan, these sometimes have rigid, these are you're doing revisions from somebody who doesn't have any good planes, scar tissue buckling, and there's also an increase in neck disability in index um, with patients who have severe cervical deformity. The complications do matter. There's early complications, uh, dysphagia, uh, infections, or C5 palsy, respiratory depression, and also significant concerns about what happens to these patients if they're extubated too early, if you've done a front back surgery, what time are you ending the surgery, um, what are your concerns about uh, the uh, feeding, nutrition, following the uh, procedure. So the ISSG sort of had an assessment of surgical, surgical treatment strategies for moderate to severe cervical spine deformity, and it reviewed a marked variation, however, in the approaches, osteotomies, et cetera. If somebody has a moderate cervical, uh, a mid-cervical apex kyphosis, 
it was 50-50 split, and then it went to cervical kyphosis with the apex at the CT junction. Most people did posterior surgery for, for uh, PSOs, et cetera. And then if they had a chin on chest, it was still posterior with anterior support. So if you look at all of this, you can see there's always permutations and there's an understanding. I want to conclude by referring back to the imaging that I did uh, before to say that if you have regional differences, the neck affects the back, the back affects the neck, you have to look at it in totality, but you have to avoid pitfalls in doing this. And how do you avoid pitfalls? It's getting your education while you can. This is a good you know, place to be. There are old techniques that doesn't need to be revisited. S cervical wiring, um, you know, at this day and age, and sure behind anybody who still does cervical wiring for adults, et cetera. So when do you do it, Dr. Chapman? As a deformity reduction aid, it's very powerful. The old uh, Wertheim Bowman wiring technique is something we should all know how to do. Okay. And do you do it in, in by itself, or you do it as an augmentation? Of I think for kids, it can be very powerful for a flexion distraction injury. Correct. We actually did that at Harbor View uh, until very recently when I left. Uh, but uh, in adults, it's a supplemental thing. Good, good. And you have to look at this picture, right? These The wires, uh, those are occipital. Uh, neuralgia wires, and I'm just trying to—I'm <laughs> just trying to say they're missing the point here. This person has poor alignment. Uh, they've done a anterior surgery. They did yes, Dr. Chapman. I, I know. Basm, I know this is basm sign. Basm sign. Tell me more. <laughs> this is basm sign. Ah. <laughs> Compensation of the upper C spine for lower cervical kyphosis. Correct. So an alignment matters, right? You, you, you just have to literally align this person. The culprits also for iatrogenic failures include uh, metastatic disease. You can go small, you can go do a corpectomy here. You have to look at, if I'm just doing a corpectomy, I have to anchor more, multiple points, not just a demetis adjacent level that probably has tumor infiltration. And then also bone quality assessment. Yes, they may be from good stock, but the numbers don't say so. Right, so if you're putting hard, high-grade um, stress-strain mismatch of bone versus your implant, you're going to have a failure. Yes. Can you go back two slides? Yes. So this is again a classic problem for me because there was a great pioneer of cervical spine surgery in Wolfram Kaspar, Kaspar Pins, mm -hmm. a professor of neurosurgery, Saarbrück and University. I actually saw him. He pioneered anterior fixation with bicortical screws. Industry has done us a disservice with promoting these short little screws, especially the self-drilling, self-tapping screws, yes. which serve only one purpose, quick in and quick out. This is biomechanically inferior in any regard. These should be bicortical screws, especially the top and bottom ones, don't you think? I agree. I agree. And, you know, they came, but... I also had a feeling. I said, oh, great, you know what? He had electrical wires going in his head. We're going to take away this implant. But bone quality, you have to go long. You know, initial films with staples looks great. Three weeks later, he has translation screws pulling out. This is, yes, this is something that needs to be fixed. Again, you have to go long. In this day and age, cervical alignment, think about the cord stretching. Um, cervical surgery is not with high risk. There's neurological injury, tracheostomy, peg tube, feeling, uh, feeding issues, infection, failure of alignment. So you gotta get, what you, get your training while you can. You know, navigation and robots are not all. You need to know what you're using them for, okay? So you have to understand frailty, decompression alone is a big no-no, poor bone quality, neoplastic disease, that you should be thinking about more points of fixation. So what is, what, what's next and what are the next pros that I can say? Physiological age versus, you know, um, the, can they undergo the correction based on how frail they are? Your bone density, rigid deformity. I always say rigid deformity, two surgeons are always better. Um, with obesity, all efforts has to make, it has to come um, to the, on board to say, we need to reduce this uh, for all. But overall, the pre-op pre detailed assessment, nutritional status. We have a whole center for perioperative medicine that we send patients there. I always know they've been there because they always come with a little bag that has a bag of goodies, protein shakes, et cetera, no matter what. And they're always happy if I send patients there a month before the surgery, as opposed to we're doing it in, in a week because they, they check their pre-albumin, et cetera. Because 
the initial post-operative, your goal is, okay, we got to get them rehab or we got to get them home. I've had patients come in with high protein and then go to rehab, come back with literally protein malnourishment. And you say, well, isn't that part of rehab? It's what they can swallow, what they can eat. So what did I do to this lady? I said, okay, we're gonna do a favorite case of mine. We're gonna do, you know, decompression stabilization. But look at the middle column. Look at the far right column. That's not enough. That's not enough correction. Uh, we didn't do her a favor. Sure enough, she, her bone quality is not good enough. She had a distal junctional kyphosis. It has to be fixed. We have to go long. We have to decompress her. So in conclusion, the cervical spine cannot be evaluated as a standalone region. Focal and dynamic measures are of great importance. Thoracolumbar mild alignment impacts cervical spine. And the T1 slope minus the cervical lordosis is more applicable parameter, but not the only parameter. And also, it's all about the patient's ability to be compensated, not yours. <laughs> and you remember the cone of economy. Thank you. Segue to the next lecture. This is outstanding and obviously a commanding overview. Thank you. Uh, what do you tell, this is a segue to the next lecture in terms of uh, David's, your partners talk about uh, sports and spine. What do you do for neck rehab? This is one of those frustrating things that, again, my, my premise is we should be owners of this and not just delegate this. But what do you tell patients to do to get good neck rehab? So post-op, pre-op. Uh, pre so neck prehab, not, not rehab. So, Things that I, I always want them to be aware of is posture, neck posture, and also avoiding, if they have neurological comp uh, compression there, is to avoid certain maneuvers that increases, you know, the uh, radiculopathy, et cetera. Traction, it's great. Um, reducing the neck spasms re related to that. Um, the, some people are like, well, my shoulders are out. I can't even swim, so I don't want to do any water therapy. But I always say reducing the negative feedback of spasms, neck pain, and also cervical kyphosis is important. I don't believe in cervical collars at all, prehab, um, but it's a great mechanism to say you have to walk, you have to be active before surgery. Simple as that. Good, good yeah. stuff. Thank you again. Thank you.